it's good to see you all here. Um, I am delighted to have Dr. Chris Harbour joining us for a conversation today around uh, strategic board management. Um, I know for me, I always talk from my own experience, because in some ways, a lot of um, how I think about um, what might be compelling uh, resources for you and comes from my own experience. And I remember um, going to my first board meeting and feeling like a fish out of water, <laughs> not really knowing what to expect. And I think that, you know, as a founder and, and the CEO of your company, um, spending some time thinking about the role of the board of a startup and how to prepare to be part of that board and, 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 and to lead the board is important. And in thinking about um, who we should have help us with this conversation, couldn't think of anyone better than Chris, uh, given the background that he's had of over 25 years um, working with startups and, and, and new companies uh, at, the intersection of, at the intersection of science, engineering, agriculture, and business. So he's currently the, one of the co-founders of Frenzy Crop Systems, uh, but his experience also includes serving as Chief Strategy Officer of Indigo, uh, Board Chair at Air, Air Scout, and Founder and CEO of Agribol, which uh, was acquired by Nutrient. Um, and for those of you in our media ecosystem, it's helpful to know that he's an adjunct professor in the departments of crop sciences and agricultural and biological engineering and an entrepreneur in residence here at Enterprise Works. So please join me in welcoming Chris Harbour. Let's give it a try. We'll give it a try see what happens. See if it doesn't. All right. Maybe we won't get no feedback or it's does sound like this one's working. Do you have one or two? Uh, mic one. Can you hear me now? Nope. Oh, now? Yes. There we go. Okay. All right. So, um, you know, Chris, where I wanted to start was I touched on um, <clears throat> what I would say is a small sliver of your experience. It's, it's quite extensive. Um, and that experience includes being on many boards. Uh, and serving in multiple different roles on the board, including founder, CEO, uh, investor, and independent director of, 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 of the board. I wonder if you could start off by just um, talking a little bit about your experience and the different types of roles you've played in the boards that you've been a part of. And then we'll start digging in a little bit more about the you know, makeup of the board, for example. Yeah, no, great question. You know, boards. Boards evolve with you and with your company. Um, you know, you always technically have a board. You know, from the time you form, and and that's when the entity is created. It's the founders. It could be just you if you were the, the sole creator, or it could be you and a partner. And uh, you kind of don't have board meetings. Just occasionally, guys like Alan will call you up and say, "Hey, it, a year has passed. You better file some reports to make the company legitimate again." You know, and that, that sort of thing happens. Um, so you start off with a board that's really just your, your founding group. And then at some point, usually the board is, is solidified with something a little more uh, cohesive and scheduled and routine, like a quarterly board meeting kind of thing, which is a, a basic standard. And that's usually when you take on your first investor. That's the way that they start to interact with you. Um, I think it's important to think, you know, your role is, as you mentioned, you know, the role of the founding CEO and uh, that role on the board, you're wearing multiple hats and you got to think about that. Your, your board hat is really you are representing yourself as a shareholder, as a founder in that company. You're representing other shareholders, perhaps, that are in the same class of stock that you're, you're representing on that board. Or you're the CEO and the CEO has a spot on the board. All right, you're invited there. And the reason for that is the board represents the shareholders, the board appoints the CEO as the single point that controls the management of the company. And the management of the company controls all the employees and the productivity and everything else. So that's the, the way in which boards and companies are structured and why the CEO appears there. So the board's job is to act on the best interests of the, uh, of the shareholders through the CEO. 
to give them direction, guidance. But the CEO really doesn't show up at the board meeting asking for advice. You really should have pre-shocked that. You should know everything that's going on. You should be prepared and talking through things. So board meetings morph from being just a, a kind of a requirement of the corporate governance to something that really helps your company grow and develop. You're bringing experts into that board. And as the board gets larger, there's a reason to bring in more investors. Say you've done a second or third round of funding. You have a representative on each one of those rounds on your board, but you also bring in some external people and bring in uh, an outside director or an independent director onto the board. And there's certain roles that they do. Um, I, I think it's important to think about you know, the role of the CEO too in all this where you know, your job is to build the culture of the company, to not run out of money, and listen to your board. That's, that's your job as a CEO. And there's all the other things like figure out how to pay the bills, direct me, and how to hire people, and everything else that, that's a challenge in a startup when you're doing it all. But your big picture goals are, are, are in, the, in, that, uh, in that structure. So it's important to think about a board is there to help you. I know some think of that stage, oh no, I'm gonna get my seed investors, they're gonna come in, they're gonna put someone on my board, and they're gonna watch what I'm doing. It's, it shouldn't be contentious. Everyone's there, and they're investing in you because they want you to succeed. You want the best people on your board possible to help guide you so that you're successful. And you're leveraging the expertise of those board members, who, by the way, are people you probably couldn't afford to hire. And they're there to help you succeed. You know, and that's, that's an important way to think about your board. They're, they're there for you. It gets to be challenged sometimes. If the company's not performing or something's gone off the rails, you're the CEO, they're zoom eyeing you in the meeting and saying, why haven't you fixed this? Why am I even hearing about this? Why is this a problem? Why aren't you performing? You're also a shareholder, you're part of the board, and, and you're in this swirl. That's, it's confusing to wear those different hats and it's challenging. It's probably one of the most challenging things young CEOs uh, go through. Um, yeah, that's great. I, I think that this is exactly why we want to unpack this and, and, and have a conversation that hopefully demystifies uh, you know, what the, the board is, its role, particularly in an early stage company. So I think for most of us, um, our familiarity with the board of directors you know, might come from, let's say, what happens in a publicly traded company, or perhaps maybe some of us have served on not-for-profit boards or things like that. How is the board of a startup, particularly an early stage startup, let's say you know, a company that's perhaps just raised a seed round, uh, how is that different from in the way it functions uh, and the relationship with the CEO specifically uh, in relation to, let's say, the board of a more established or publicly traded company? Well, you know, as you get more mature in a business, you're more sure of your business model, you're more sure of your revenue goals. There's more things that are solid in the company. So as the company gets larger, as you get further along, there are more things that are, I, I, we'll call them routine, but they're expected check-ins that you would have in a board meeting. You would expect at a later stage company to see sales projections for this quarter and next quarter and maybe five-year projections of where the company's headed. You'd expect to see all that. At a seed stage, you might not even have a product market fit yet. You may still just be on the edge of taking some technology out of the university and trying to commercialize it. You're pre-revenue. I haven't even really thought about sales projections. Uh, and you're thinking more about the technology and the hurdles and who do I need to hire to make sure we have execution on that technology first. So some of the discussions are a little different. I think what's important to think, as soon as you pull investors into a company, and I'll say something maybe a little provocative, but I want you all to think about this. The second you pull investors into your company and they're venture investors, as a CEO, you have fired yourself in the future. Does that make sense to everybody? Say it there. You have fired yourself in the future from that role. There's a, there's a link to every role. Look, you go, go and get your master's degree. You're an assistant. I have an assistantship for two years. There's an end to that role. All roles end. You know, it's, there's no forever positions anywhere unless you have a lifestyle business. Right? So you, you have utility to that business in that role for a certain period of time. Um, and the board is the group who says if you don't perform in the business, you're probably going to be out at some time. 
And it turns out that usually boards are balanced. You usually have you know, two uh, representatives of, say, the, uh, the common shareholders or the founders of the, of the company. And you, by then, you probably have two representatives for maybe a first and second round of funding. Well, that's an even number. And you kind of know where that conversation is going. The founders want to execute on a vision. The investors are saying, we don't really want to put in an extra million dollars here. How, how do we get together? Well, there's a fifth person usually as an independent director. Well, it's usually that one person who's deciding whether you stay or go as a, as a founding CEO in that role. Um, so there's, there's a, a construction piece there that's super important too about getting the right kind of expertise and, and viewing that size. So I see the dynamics on, on younger boards are more about, okay, everything in a startup's on fire. You're always out of money. The technology's always going off the rails. The sales are never coming as quick as you want. Everything's wrong. The board members know this. They're venture capitalists. They've seen hundreds of companies like this. So they're on your board to help you not be the statistic, but be the success story. You know, and, and that's a really important um, way to think of they are using their expertise to help you not mess it up as you're trying to learn the ropes and realizing that you're coming to the board, deer in the headlights, trying to figure out like, how do I make sense of this company that's going nine different directions? That's the early stage board. The later stage board is more about things that you would expect, revenue targets. Uh, you might have a whole meeting on the strategic vision of where you want to go, or maybe you want to do an acquisition of another small company and, and you're trying to decide when and if you can do that, where will the resources come, and how will that increase your sales numbers would be the only reason you do an acquisition at that point. So the different conversations happen at later stages, and you have different types of uh, board members as you go through this. Early stage, they're representatives of your investors because those investors want to watch their money, they're taking a big risk. As you move to later, it might be someone who you've added as an independent director who has a wonderful set of connections that can help either position you to sell into a market that you do not have connections in or into uh, a, a way to position a company for sale and saying, I know the three companies that could probably buy this wonderful startup technology. Let's go talk to them and see if there's an exit opportunity in something like that. So there's all kinds of reasons and, and differences between the early and late stage. Yeah, so when you and I you and I had a brief conversation in preparation for this, and you sort of characterized uh, this transition from essentially uh, you know pre venture capital investment and post and, and firing yourself for the future. The minute you said that, that, that kind of hit me as something that was going to be controversial, right? And so we, we kind of unpacked that a bit. Um, and I think the reason is that. You know, from the perspective of, of a founder, and, and, and like I always say, I'm, I'm un, unapologetically, uh, you know, founder um, driven in, in, in the way I think about things, um, is that, you know, for most founders, it's, it's really about uh, a vision and executing towards a vision, right? And, and, and so, you know, this idea of, of firing yourself in the future. Uh, as a result of essentially, um, you know, uh, taking some uh, some venture capital investment, you know, struck me as something that was going to be. I, I understand what exactly what you're saying, but it struck me as something that was going to create some tension, particularly, you know, in the idea that perhaps the freedom a CEO might have to uh, to move the company towards a, a, a specific 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 vision. Is, is likely going to be constrained or, or, or challenged. So, so from that standpoint, um, is there some merit to essentially, regardless of how much capital you raise, um, delaying, uh, you know, bringing on board investors as your uh, directors on the board if you can actually make that happen? So, okay, so would you want to delay the construction of a board um, to get your your ducks in a row from a, a company perspective, uh, it, it's that's a that's a judgment call. You know, it, it's going to come down to you know, like you said, the, the vision that someone has as the CEO. It also comes down to uh, the needs. You know, one one of the the I, I don't know. It's it's a it's a self aware philosophy that I have. You know, the, the more self aware you are 
about your role and your position, and that, that's this observation of being, you know, firing yourself in the future. That concept is, is self-awareness. I know that I am not the guy for a later stage company. I am not the right CEO to set up a management framework and to build out a team and, and sit around and talk about you know, org charts and things that drive me out of my mind. You, you should fire me if you, I'm the wrong guy for that role. I'm aware, I'm aware of that. I know, my, I know what I'm good at. I know what I'm good at early stage. And you know, that, that's an important realization of that, that kind of self-awareness up front. Um, you know, as you think about the, uh, the challenge of then, depending on who you are as a founder, really being self-aware about that, knowing if you are going to have to discuss your vision and have it potentially directed not too far from where you go. Remember, I mean, investors, they invested in you. They want you leading the company. They, they made the investment in you. But if you are unwilling to see a directional change, even marginally towards something that might be revenue generating at the recommendation of your board, then yeah, you probably should delay. But you gotta be self-aware that knowing that you are going to have a problem taking direction in that way unless your vision is fixed to a point where then you can say, okay, now it can go this way or this way or this way, it can go seven ways, but I feel I got to the place where that vision is locked in and I feel like I've birthed this baby. And at that point, you know, now I can let it go off to preschool there or preschool there and it's gonna be fine either direction. So in, in some of the conversations I've had with investors who have served on, on my board uh, in the past, there is this implicit um, recognition that they're, they're playing two roles, right? They're investors and then there's a governance role that they play on the board. And most of the time, those, those two things, the interests of those two roles align. Sometimes they diverge. Um, how can an understanding of the fact that there is there's some conflict there, right? Especially in situations where those interests diverge. How can an understanding of the fact that there is that conflict help uh, new CEOs, especially, uh, manage manage the board towards the vision that they're looking to execute towards? Yeah, you know, there's a couple of key stages and. And I've, I've had experiences both personal and I've seen it in other companies where I've been on the board as an independent director or otherwise, where, where you see something from an investor go maybe in a direction you hadn't anticipated. There's, maybe there's a director who is representing the seed round investors and it wasn't necessarily the person that you worked with. Like you, you form a deep relationship with a venture capitalist as you're trying to bring them in. You've met with them multiple times, brought them on board, they've understood your vision, they believe in you as a management team, they believe in the technology. And then say someone else gets on the board, like, oh, that, that person that you met with and you really connected with is too busy. And they bring another person from the firm into the, in, onto your board. And you go, well, look, they're, they're friends of a friend, but how bad could they be, you know? Well, it's, it's like getting married to be on a board to these early investors. You really have to, you have to have dated, you gotta know the person before you, you get into that sort of situation. Um, and so I, I think there's a little bit of that upfront work that you have to do to really do the proper diligence on and be real. It's, you know, it's that self-awareness again. Is this the kind of person that I could work with? And if they're not, be clear about it. And sometimes you don't know. You know sometimes the person seems wonderful up front. I'm on a board of a company that uh, during COVID, they raised money. So there was no in-person meetings. And the venture capitalist said later to me, this was in a private conversation, said, if I'd met that management team face-to-face, -face, I never would have made this investment. And he was the representative of the Series A round in this company. And you go, wow, okay, so this guy's got a negative attitude towards this management team. He's got an ax to grind, like it's, like, like I left the toilet seat up the other night. You can't fix that. Like that, that happened. Like that guy is, he's, he, he's, he's got an ax to grind against this management team. And ultimately that led to uh, the removal of the CEO. You know, so you really do have to think carefully about these. There's also tools though, as a CEO, if you see something going off the rails, you can use your other board members to help you. You know, this is not something that you bring up in the board meeting, but you call somebody before and say, Hey, you know, 
bill over there is really being a problem for me. I, I want it to be you know, fair and balanced, but this isn't working out. Can, can you, because it's very hard socially for you as the CEO to say, Bill, you're being a real pain on this board. I'd like you to leave. You know, that's, that's a tough thing to do socially, and it, it might go the wrong way. It might really blow up in your face. But having another board member say, George over here, Bill, you know, Bill, maybe, maybe you need to assign someone else from your firm to come onto this board. We, just, we, we need this to be more constructive. We're really excited about this technology. We want to see it go away. We really want the CEO to be successful. Uh, you, want, you want to recover your investment back from this. Like, don't explode this company, you know, that sort of thing. So there, there's, there's ways in which other board members, and that's why it's so important to build a group that you can rely on. You know, yeah. But those board members are, are deep and it's not so shallow. So. Yeah. I think um, that's a good segue into the next part of this conversation I want to have, which is uh, you know, the role of the independent board member, especially. You, you, you described the structure of an early stage board as essentially you know, having two from the found, founding team or the management team, two investors and the independent. Uh, and that independent then, by definition, plays a really important role. Um, you know, for founders who are thinking about how do I ensure I have some level of control of the board, whether that's the right thing or a wrong way of thinking about it or not, I'd, I'd love to hear your perspective on that. But if you're thinking, I want to have some level of, of, of control, a fighting chance, right? Because there is, there is an interesting um, power asymmetry between uh, a founder who is then getting investment uh, in, into their company, right? It, you're supposed to lead the board on some level, at least on strategic issues, but you also then report the board, and by the way, these are the guys that work the checks into the company, right? It's, it, it can be difficult to manage that, and I think to the extent that you have a strong uh, independent director that is really bought in on your vision, that that person can be really helpful on the board. So, can you, can you talk a little bit about what, what, is, what should founders, especially in the early stage, be looking for uh, in terms of the profile of an independent director, and how do you approach the role, and, and, and you know, how have you seen that role uh, played effectively? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question, because you, you can go two directions. You can find someone, uh, well, I, two directions, I mean, there's, there's what is your preference, or what do you, what do you really focus in on, because no one is everything. You know, you can't find this mythical person, and if they exist, they're probably on seven other boards, and they probably don't have the time to be uh, helping you with a, the eighth company, right? For example, so you know, the the right way to think about it is either you're looking for an independent, and depending on your stage, who can open doors, who can do introductions, who uh, adds a sense of gravitas to the board overall, but. You know, also someone that you can get along with. You have to get real with, with these folks. Like that independent director is someone that you are ultimately in, in a position where you have, all startups go wrong, right? Everything goes off the rails, something goes wrong. You are going to be worried about the future of your company in almost every board meeting. <laughs> that's, that's just kind of how it goes. So, you know, the best thing to do is to have someone that you would feel comfortable texting or calling a week or two before the board meeting and saying, hey, put together the financials. We're way off track on our sales forecasts. Bill is going to explode in the meeting. Like, what do you think I should do? You got to be able to have that conversation ahead of time and not be worried about it. You know, and that's, that's the role of the independent. Because then the independent can work on your behalf and say, okay, you guys are doing everything right. We get it. It's a problem. Um, I'm going to go talk to them. Because the whole board meeting happens before the board meeting. I hope everyone gets that. The board meeting is just like the note taking of what you've pre-sold over the previous month to your board. You know, all of the action happens before the board meeting. And if it doesn't, you've messed up as the CEO. If the action happens in the board meeting, you are unprepared for that board meeting. You did not do your job. And if you get fired from it, you probably deserve it because you were unprepared. You weren't focused on this. It's a super important part. This member, as you're taking on a role of the CEO, that is the leader, the chief executive officer of the business. The, the role there is to make sure that business succeeds, that it doesn't fail. If you're running out of money, you have to fire people. Like it, 
doesn't matter whether they're your friends or you like them. Like you have to make sure payroll is met, that the company is solvent, all these things happen. Like that's an important role of the CEO. And the board is going to give you that direction. Hey, you got to cut the company in half. Sales weren't as good, but got to get rid of half of these guys, unfortunately. You know, and you're going to have to make that call coming away from it. So those those things are real. Those things happen in a startup, and um, there's no time like the present. It's a really hard call to make to, to be that calloused in, in terms of how you're feeling about your baby. It's your technology. It's your company. It's people you've hired and handpicked. You know, that's if things go bad. Things always go bad, but a lot of times things go good. You know, and if things are going good, you need uh, the same type of advice from someone. You know, well, hey, things are going so great. How do we focus? Because if you lose focus as a startup, that's a big problem too. So getting your board to help you focus on the things that are the most certain sources of revenue or the most impactful outcomes in your market. One thing that I think, um, you know, just from my experience and from talking to other, other founders would, would be helpful is, is, is a board director, that an independent director that, that in some sense shields the CEO from getting too bogged down with um, demands from the board, right? <clears throat> so you're, you're, the CEO is always going to be interacting with various board members. That's important for, for a lot of different reasons, including preparing for board meet, meetings, as you mentioned. But there, there are times when you have board members who don't really understand their roles and are trying to run the company from the board of directors. Have you seen? Uh, effective independent directors play that role? Because I'm trying to help our founders think of, you know, what are the tools and, and levers you can actually have at your disposal for, for managing your board so it doesn't become the, the predominant thing that you spend your time doing? Yeah, you know, one of the things to, to think about is, is cadence of board meetings. Quarterly board meetings come up really quick, you yeah. know. If something's going off the rails, your board may suggest that you start meeting monthly. That's rough, you know. Sometimes we've I've been on boards that are meeting weekly. You know, now try to become prepared and do prep conversations and and pre-sell everything so that there's no surprises in a weekly cadence board meeting with five people that are all busy. It's nearly impossible. Right? So, you know, to, to think about um, having others on the board who, who get that and say, no, this is too frequent of a meeting, or even someone who's like, even if that does work for their schedule, is willing to say, that doesn't work for my schedule. <laughs> Let's push it a week. Right, right. You know, those are super helpful tools yeah. in, in helping you be successful. And, and really what you're looking for is someone who's willing, who believes in you, believes in the technology, and who's willing to be a mentor to you in this process. That's the right type of board member for an independent role. Good. Um, so if we, if we backtrack a bit, because I think that if I was in the audience, this, this would be on my mind. Um, you, you, you talked about ensuring that you're building a board that you can get along with, right? They, you know, they're gonna bring strategic value to the company, but also these are folks that you have to be comfortable having real conversations with. And ideally, you like to be around, right? It doesn't help spending time with them if you, if you, don't, if you don't really like being around them. However, there's the real constraint of, you know, oftentimes um, it's difficult to, you know, to be that strategic in deciding who you're going to take money from when, you know, you need to make payroll and, you know, your runway is vanishing. Um, so, so how do you strike that balance? I mean, clearly if someone's the wrong board member and, um, you know, they, they're the principal of the fund and, they want to be the, uh, the director um, you know, that sits on your board. You need the money, uh, but you don't need them. <laughs> so how do you think through how to make those decisions? Yeah, you know, it's just, it's, it's strategy and what you're comfortable with. And, you know, I, I talk a lot about the role of, of a CEO being really a sales role. You're selling, you're selling to employees, you're selling to your board, you're selling all the time. And you just have to think of that person on your board as someone you're selling to. You, know, you, you have to do your job to, 
well, if they're, if they're struggling and you need to close them, you need to spend more time with them. So even though it, it might be painful, you know, digging in harder with a person like that is probably the way to make sure they feel like you're, you're doing everything you can to watch for their investment and listen to what they have to say. Yeah, that's helpful. So the independent director clearly are a helpful tool. Um, some boards have chairs. Right. Yeah. Um, what is that role in your experience, and is that another tool that, that CEOs can, can leverage to ensure that the board is actually being um, creating strategic value for the company, as opposed to simply, you know, being directive and, and, and making things difficult for the CEO? Yeah, I'm, I'm interested. I'd, I'd like to ask Alan a question about board chairs too. I, I've seen board chairs largely in later stage companies where they're bigger, where you have a board that's constructed of a number of industry experts, maybe it's a nine person or a you know, 13 or 11 person board, it's a rather large board, and you have a board chair who is organizing a group of investors, they are representing, they're probably appointed by, let's say the first investor or the lead investor or the ones with the, the most rights into the company, and they're very effective in operating where the CEO is operating the business, the CEO is bringing things to the board, but that um, board chair or, or individual is there to uh, make sure that that board is properly informed and is helping with some of those pre-calls and pre-setups when you have a board meeting coming up and you've got to get you know, 12 cats with driver's licenses all prepped on what the board meeting right. is, you know? And, and that's sort of like a, one, one aspect of it, I would say the other time I've seen board chairs is around a company that's done a transition. Say you're transitioning away from one CEO to another CEO, a, a, a chairman of the board or a board director might be the one who actually removes the CEO and is interim for a period of time while you're doing a search for the next CEO. I've seen it happen. I don't know, Alan, if there's other, other ways in which you've seen that work effectively. Yeah, I, I was going to ask your experience on that topic because I want to learn from you. But yeah. a couple that you haven't mentioned would be more, uh, you know, larger company where you'll have maybe somebody who's been with a local bank forever and kind of moves. Okay, I'm a semi, I'm the big picture guy. I'm not involved in daily. I used to be involved with the president or the CEO. I'm going to be the board chair. And now I'm kind of the big picture person uh, that maybe will maybe run a board meeting. I, I've seen it there, I've seen it in not for profit settings too. You'll have a board chair and the committee executive committee and, and such. <clears throat> we'll do a lot of the real work. The rest of the board members are just kind of, they show up and say, okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, the, the other thing I was going to ask is do you ever see an executive committee in the boards that you serve on? Would be a, a question that, if you guys have time, would be interesting to hear. Yeah, so, you know, I, I, I think it's a tool. So, what, what Alan, is talking about. So I've, I've seen businesses where you have an executive committee that's meeting that's run by the CEO. And that would be like an executive management team. And that's, that's different from, say, an executive session of a board, too, where, um, has anyone heard of board advisors or having um, board observers, yeah. too? Like, you know, you, you can have a board of advisors that's not your board of directors. Sometimes those mix. I'm actually on a board of advisors for a company and they mistake that for a board of directors um, a little bit too. And you're like, wait, I, I, I don't represent you as a shareholder. You know, I'm, I'm an advisor to you on business matters. Um, but a, an executive uh, session of a board is a tool to remove some of the observers. Now, I'll, I'll give you an example of that. When, when I had a board meeting with Agrable, we had an observer, ADM uh, was one of our investors. They were not the lead of the round, but they put in enough money that they wanted observation rights. So they could show up to the board meetings, and they didn't have a vote, but, I mean, nothing really gets to a vote in a board meeting. I mean, come on, it's either the right choice and everybody agrees, or it's not the right choice, and the company explodes, right? So, so you, you, you have this opportunity for an observer to be there in every board meeting and say things at the inopportune or opportune time, right? With, depending on your perspective. It might be the perfect time and they say the exact right thing or it's the wrong time and they, they, they go, oh gosh, I wish I hadn't said that. Now we're gonna have three more board meetings. You know, that, both of that can happen. Well, if you want to just talk to your board, and let's say you've got a five person board with three observers, 
you can call an executive session at the end of the board meeting. You have the standard board meeting, everybody's invited. Executive session, a number of people get kicked out, including your other, uh, typically, you may have, let's say, your CFO and your chief marketing officer may be in the meeting with you, presenting to the board. In executive session, it's the CEO and the board members. It's not anyone else. And that, that's a tool that you can use to, uh, uh, to, to talk to your board or to make a vote or to, to, to think about a perspective that's different. Uh, so, um, as we kind of transition here a bit to, towards uh, Q&A, there are a few additional questions that I have, again, just trying to surface uh, some tools that founders can use. Um, you know, in, 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 in our conversation, in our prep conversation, sort of talking about, um, you know, how much time a, a CEO might spend, you know, managing the board versus managing the business, which, you know, is actually a consideration early, early on uh, for, for young companies. Um, you talked about the potential of having something that's more like a, like a corporate development role uh, to, to support the CEO. Um, at what stage, first of all, can you describe what, what, what that role would be, what, what the title might be, and at what stage in the company's uh, evolution would, would a role like that be helpful? Yeah. So it, it took me a while to develop an understanding of what corporate development meant. I had no idea. I bet the group here, like you're like, corporate development, what are you guys even talking about? You know, what is that? What, what is a person who would do that as their job? There, there are people, that's their whole thing, right? Is there, they are the corporate development lead. What, what they're doing is really supporting you in the role of getting your next round of funding or preparing materials for the board. They are your Swiss army knife of business functions. They understand financial modeling. They would know how to put together and construct a proper five-year forecast. They would know how to prepare the diligence materials. When an investor said, you, say you have a great meeting with a venture capitalist, you know, oh, that was great, we love your technology. Uh, set, open up your diligence room for us. Let's, let's have it take a look and we'll go a step further. And you're like, a, a what? A diligence room? What, what are you even talking about? If that's what you're thinking, then this is where a corporate development person can really help. You know, they know exactly what needs to be in that room. They know how to pull those things together. There are some that do this as, as a contract. You know, they'll, they'll help you for a, a month or two. So, you know, when do you need someone like that? I, I've been at businesses that have had none, been at businesses that need one, and I've been at businesses that have whole teams of those, of those folks. And I was most recently with Indigo, where we raised $2 billion. And you don't raise $2 billion in venture capital without a team of corporate development people. And they are making sure the investors are all happy, that all of their financial diligence questions are answered, that all the prep, because you as the CEO will get overwhelmed with that. If you're tasked with going out and meeting, let's say, 50 venture capitalists to land one or two, you have to be preparing that next meeting. You really don't have time to do the follow-up to the trail of destruction that you're leading. That's what your corporate development person's for. Their background is in business. Their background is in, I've seen engineers and um, strategy consultants. Has everyone heard of McKinsey, Boston Consulting Group, and others? They are odd consultants that come out of that. They're very, very skilled in a very certain way, um, but they have exactly the skill set needed to help you on corporate development. So there's not a lot of those people in Champaign-Urbana. I think there would be more, perhaps, in the in the business school, um, and you know, getting interaction there, I think, would be important. But I think it's one of the things that's that's uh, an impediment to companies raising real venture dollars. You know, the difference between raising 10, 000, 10 million and a hundred million is a corporate development function. That's the only difference. With slightly better slide decks, slightly different venture capitalists who are willing to write bigger checks, but it's the corporate development group that that helps you get to that, that next level up, if, if you want to afford it. But then you need to raise $100 million because you got a whole team of, of uh, corporate development folks. So it, it, again, it depends on what you're trying to do with your business and your fastest, most efficient, effective path to, uh, to revenue and, and company growth. So when things are working really well at a startup, um, 
on average, if you were going to you know, give someone a framework to, to consider, what, what should the time split be in terms of you know, focusing on running the operations of your company versus, versus managing the board? Yeah, it, it's, um, I'm going to say it depends. It depends on where you are in terms of your needs and your cycle and what that board is needing from you. Um, if we, let, let's just say the idealized case of you just raised a $5 million seed round, you have plenty of cash in the bank, the tech team is going to town building whatever your technology is, and you've got your first quarterly board meeting. You know, well, there's some construction things, there's some you know, housekeeping things that you need to be thinking about. Um, it's, it should certainly take you, um, you know, 15 to 15% 15 of your time should be spent thinking back about, about the board. It should also, it, that time helps you keep, um, helps you keep your eye on, on the strategy of it. I think when you get a little too operational as an early stage CEO, the opportunity to have a board meeting helps you pop out of that day to day and think more strategically. I think it's an, it's healthy to, to do some of that too. Um, if you are coming out of a board meeting, I think the, the, the intention is like, oh, finally, I got that board meeting done. Let me get back to my real job. You know, that's the wrong instinct. You gotta fight that because you should come out of that board meeting with it fresh in your head and start planning for the next one. And it's the last thing you wanna do. It's the hardest thing you're gonna have to do is try to make sure that you start planning for that next one. And then your job is to get that disseminated to your team, get your team working and thinking of what's come out of that board meeting, and then have monthly check-ins with your team to make sure you're on track. And then at least you, you, you have to give your board a chance to review the material that you're about to talk to them about. Right? So you've got to give them at least 10 days, at least a week, maybe two weeks, to review detailed financials. They're busy people. You should get that out at least two weeks before. So back up from that, you should be having conversations with them about what you're gonna present at the board meeting the week before. So the month leading up to a board meeting is very much about material prep and uh, pre-selling to the board. Well, if you're meeting quarterly, that's every three months. So you come out of one board meeting, you immediately get your team working on the things. You have a check-in with your team then at one month, and at the second month, at the second month, that's really when you need to be preparing materials for the board meeting that's coming up. So uh, the art is to, as a CEO, you are a delegating <coughs> entity. That, that's your point. You represent the company and the management. You have to be able to delegate that work to pull it off. And, and that's, that's sometimes a hard step of, but I'm the expert. I'm the person that can actually get that done. Well. Maybe you need to hire somebody who's a chief operations officer who can get the operations of the company working while you think more strategically and manage the board and the investment and making sure your job as CEO is don't run out of money, build the culture. Those two things, you build the right culture of I disseminate, I pass down, I trust people, I empower people. That's the right kind of culture to be successful. That's great. Um, so then finally, uh, before we open it up for Q&A, um, so you talked about essentially doing diligence on potential investors to, to understand whether or not they're going to fit your culture as a company and, and, and how productive they're going to be on the board. And, and you mentioned that you know sometimes it looks like they would be good, but then reality <laughs> sets in and, and they're either not as productive or you know personality-wise they're just really negative for the culture. So how do you fire? A board member. <laughs> Great question. Um, you know, I, I, I think I explained a little bit before of, of one way that you can, which is is working through your other board members to convince them that this person is a problem. Um, the other is you can have a frank conversation with someone who's an independent director or someone who was brought in. Say the business has changed direction. Like I need to bring on some people who are going to help me execute in this market. I loved working with you. Here's the complete vesting of all your stock options. We're making a role open on the board. Um, we're, we're eliminating your position in a sense, you know, and I'm going to hire someone on the board over here who can take me in this direction. They're difficult conversations. You know, I, I, I think impossible conversations if it's 
if it's the representative of one of your main investors. Yeah. All right. So I'm sure you have questions. Uh, so let's open it up uh, and see. Uh, we can have a discussion about whatever questions you have. Um, my question is, how do you clearly distinguish between a independent board member and a, and a member of a, the advisory board? I mean, independent board member of a management team of a company versus an advisory board member. Yeah, you know, they, they could be, that's a great spot to harvest an independent board member from, is your advisory board. Um, you know, it, it's, it's interesting, you know, when you think about what an advisory board is there for, and I've, I've had advisory boards that make up a representative of the customers, for example, um, you know, they're advising on things that are important to them as the customer of your business. I, I think it's, it's important not to spend probably too much time on a board of advisors and focus more on, I think, constructing the board in, in the way that works because you're just going to run out of time, you know. And, and I, I think the board of advisors are, are great in certain businesses and helpful, um, but uh, working hard to pick one that you would make as your independent Focusing more on your board is maybe some advice I would give. Not a situation where you've had outside capital. Say a company has the ability to basically self-finance what might have otherwise been an outside capital. Try to put yourself in that position and think about how much extra free time you would have and what value you would be lacking from you know being having to prepare and think about what the board's going to ask you. Basically, okay, money doesn't matter <laughs> in this thing. You're, you're, you're cash flowing, what's important to you? Well, then it's then, then what becomes, I, I think, a shift from your company is now surviving, right? Your company is, is likely on a path to success. So how do, you, how do you transition that board to thinking about how do you grow revenue? You know, and really, that, that's, a, that's a challenging piece, you know? I, I, one of the observations I've had through different startups is that there seems to be a tension between the development team that's developing the technology and the sales team. Oh, you're trying to sell my product. Like, how dare you try to sell my product, you know? Well, it's, that's the whole point. Like, that's it. Like, that's the point, is to sell the technology. So, um, everyone needs to have an all-for-one, one-for-all attitude there, too, you know, around that. But, you know, from a, from a board perspective, I, I would... I would think the the better use of the time then if you're not if you're not worried about where's the next round going to come from and you're getting off of that uh, merry-go-round of one round leads to the next round leads to the next round leads to the bridge round leads to the next round. Um, you need that sort of venture funding if it's a business that has huge capital requirements up front. You know, and the quicker you can get to revenue, the better. I mean, I, I have a, a number of companies that. Are revenue generated? They they make money, and it's it's refreshing, you know. I mean, there's there's one. I'm on the board of one company that has a NASCAR team. Costs them seven million dollars a year for the NASCAR team. They don't need a NASCAR team. There's no part of their business that requires this. That's a fun board to be on because they're thinking about well, do we have the NASCAR team or do we buy that company over there to make a little more money? They're, they're, the boards are completely different than. The boards I'm on, where it's like, oh, we're out of money. We're going to have to raise a bridge. We're short of our sales targets. But the compelling technology might be that company that's struggling. It's really technically interesting to talk and think about how do you make that thing work. Where the company with the NASCAR team is fun. It's interesting, but you know, hugely interesting in terms of how do you grow revenue and how do you grow the business and how do you think about a broader impact. Really interesting stuff going on there. But, but two kind of different different fields. What's your take on the, um, so we had some like power networkers basically reaching out and like offering, wanting to get on the board of advisors uh, with the, for the promise of you know, connecting us to potential customers, et cetera, et cetera. What's your take on that basically still potentially not, taking advantage of benefiting, not losing the potential benefit of that, but playing it safe, or like, how would you navigate that situation? Yeah, it's interesting, so, so like this is, 
somebody who sees your technology and has done a wonderful search in LinkedIn and found you and connected and said, oh, I've got all these people I can introduce you to. We've even met, like, never yeah. met LinkedIn. Yeah, I would say, like, the, the one thing you got to worry about with, with connectors is they have a Rolodex. They're a personality type that is like a collector. You know, they collect people, they collect uh, relationships, and they can leverage those relationships in exchange for something. They're, they're going to have to take that person out to dinner, but they like taking that person out to dinner, you know, and, and they're going to get some stock options in your company as a result of introducing you. They can open so many doors so quickly that they'll just overwhelm you and you won't be able to, to keep track. So I, I think some of those are, are helpful, but you also got to watch too many introductions and too many people. You can't possibly manage that many relationships on the backside because you have to do the hard work. All they have to do is introduce you to a buddy who they went out to dinner with them and told, swirled them all up about your, your, your company and now you have to go and try to turn that into something. And you know, you have, I think you have to be very thoughtful and careful about um, how many of those doors you open. Um, it, it, would, you, would you want them on a board of advisors or a board of directors? Potentially, I, I've seen it go the, the other way. I, I've seen some people who are perceived as, well, this person was a CEO in this company, and now they're they're retired. And if I brought them on, they'll unlock the whole food industry because they just knew everyone. Well, yes and no. You know, it's still about your technology and whether it's a fit. They can help you get in the door, and that might be useful. But if, if you're going to select them as an independent board member, for example, you'd want to make sure they were able to help you with your business and they had the time to do so. I worry about the people that are a little bit like, well, I can introduce you to five people. Well, then why don't you? Isn't that just a nice thing to do as a human? You know? So, you know, think about that a little too in those. Um, I, I think, you know, an interesting question that, that I've been thinking about is um, this, you know, I, I felt this as well as, 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 as a founder, a co-founder in a company, uh, being one of the first employees, and then ultimately, you know, becoming CEO. Is there is there's a tendency, and it may be it may be real. I, I don't know. I'm still trying to decide about this. To think that in order to actually direct the vision of a company, you need to be the CEO. Um, is that true in your in your experience, uh, particularly in a case where perhaps you know the, the 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 execution, the operations of the company has sort of exceeded perhaps the the ability or the interest of the founder to run the, the, the company day to day? Is there another role uh, that a, a founder can play uh, as part of a, a growing business that still essentially helps the company stay true to its, its original vision or mission. And of course that comes with constraints of you know, having a founder in and around the business in a situation where you've gone out and perhaps gotten another CEO and all of the dynamics that get emerged from that. Yeah, structure is helpful in that, but relationships are, are what makes that happen. So if, if you are, uh, let's say, a, the founder, you've never really been a CEO, you're the founder of a company, and you're debating, you haven't even assigned titles to anyone, you're debating, like, do I take the CEO role or not? Potentially you should, but if, if you need to bring in a CEO to help run the company, see a lot of uh, chief science officers, um, chief strategy officers are the people who probably have the most fit in terms of their ability to uh, understand the technology and see the vision of the business, but they aren't the executive leader, per se. And, and, and you can see that go well, and I've seen it go off the rails, too. And, and where it goes well, you have a strong relationship between that person and the CEO. And that means regular meetings. Yeah. That's what it means. It means regular contact and interaction and discourse and, and thinking between the people. Thanks a lot for this presentation. It's been really nice. Um, I got. I want to go back to the independent director. I'm on that journey right now. 
Um, it's a two-part question. One is, can you give me any more insight? My, my board's pushing for an independent director, but they're also going to feel about it. Other than you know having some kind of corporate veil and independent direction, are there other reasons the board will push for an independent director, board director, to feel about it? And then the other question I have is, you know, you've really enlightened me here. I think I was under managing that situation. Um, that I needed to take a little bit more of an active approach in that. Just in, in terms of a sense of how much time or effort I should invest into making sure that person is the right person, can you, can you give me some guidance on that? Yeah, it, it's it's an important decision. I'll, I'll give you an example. I'm, I'm, a, I'm an independent director on a, a small company called uh, Rantizum. They do drone spraying, and they're, they're headquartered in Iowa. Um, I, I was so I'm just going to talk about my journey of how they found me. You know, I didn't know any of the founders. Um, I had a friend of, it was a friend of a friend. They, they asked around to their network and said, hey, I really need someone who's an experienced CEO, someone who's founded a company who could be an independent director for me um, and who, who might be excited by that. And they knew that I had a pilot's license. I was involved in, in, in you know, aircraft and aircraft management. Um, they convinced me to at least take a meeting. And we had a series of meetings, phone meetings, phone calls, where you got to know the person, ask them questions. It was just that sort of thing. But it, it was a process that probably took about two months, you know, a back and forth, where they were, they were checking out other people, and I was one on a list. Um, and, you know, ultimately, they, they chose me for that role. Um, it's a lot of work. You know, I didn't, I didn't take it lightly. I knew that that was a, a, a role that I had to really think about. So part of it is figuring out what's the incentive. You don't really want to pay an independent director, but they should get some stock options. So you got to think about do you have that mechanism in place to compensate them correctly for their time and energy and align them to your own success by, by using stock options as an example. Um, you know, that, that's something to think about. But you know, in terms of time, I say you know, reach, out to your, reach out to your network and say, who do you know? Who's there? Because a warm introduction to someone is a critical way in. But you know, it, I got to say, it, it was a it was a bit of a. Um, I felt great to help out. I was like, oh yeah, I could really help them. I, I could see how I could help them. It, it felt good to to be thought of as an independent director for that company. For example. Okay, we'll make this our last question because we're at time. Sure. Um, especially for like early stage companies, how do you think about the threshold for um, accepting an early board member? Because in my view, the role of the board changes quite significantly as the company grows. So, like, how do you think of setting the bar? Of, like, well, if you're filling half the round, sure, or something like this, or if you yeah. have these connections. Yeah. Uh, so, a great question. I, I think. I mean, my personal feeling is the earlier you can have a board, the better, because there are experienced business people who can help you make good decisions, and you're getting their experience. I mean, particularly, uh, I'll think back to Agrible, De Dennis Beard, who some of you know. Dennis was on my board. He was, we, we raised a seed round from Sarah Ventures. He came on as the third board member. It was two of the founders and Dennis. I got Dennis, he, he's an he's, he's a expert. I got him for basically free. Like he, he gave us money and now he's on my board. I was like, this is fantastic. I love having this guy. You know, that, that sort of thing is, is, is how you got to think about a board, I think. And, and um, you should be so lucky to have their, their expertise and help, you know, as early as possible. But I, I, I would recommend that, you know, even if you are in the process of raising and or you're going the SBIR route, it's a little bit longer. Uh, in terms of before you might have to raise something like that, that you're thinking about bringing in just a three-person board before you even have an investor. And then when you bring that first investor on, you bring them on, that's four, and you hire an independent, that's five. Now you've got a really wonderful five-person board, and you're ready to go. So. All right. Sure. Yeah, so ask you for a friend. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, so, have you seen examples of people raising C? Uh, and uh, so we have about eight and a half million C round. We don't have a board. I'm the board. Um, have you seen examples of people raising project capital, uh, going ahead and becoming sustainably, you know, generating revenue and becoming sustainable, and never having a board? Um, you know, I, it's an interesting concept. 
uh, I mean, you, you have a board, right? It's you. Um, I would think to, uh, unless, it's a, it's a great question, to not have a board at all. Um, I don't know, I, you, you would have to continue to have investors who were motivated and aligned and trusted you alone to make all of the choices with their money. I, I think at some point that just won't fly. You know, that, that'll, that'll reach a point where they go, no, we're, we're not gonna put our money in. And, and that might ultimately self-select away from some investors that you should have in your business. It might, might select investors that maybe you shouldn't have that are looking for something else out of your business. So no real life examples exist. You haven't seen the examples. No, I don't have any examples of that. Yeah. yeah. Cool, thank you. Yeah. All right, so let's thank Chris. Chris, that was awesome.